So our final speaker this afternoon is Jeffrey Bennington. Jeff is the Asa G. Handler Professor of Modern French Thought at Emory University. He's the author of numerous, and I mean numerous, books and articles on Derrida and deconstruction. His two most recent books are Scatter One and Kant on the Frontier, both of which were published with Fordham. Jeff is a member of the editorial team for Derrida Seminars in French, as well as the Derrida Seminars Translation Project, and with Peggy Kemoff, general editor of the seminars in English. As I mentioned this morning, Jeff was instrumental, indispensable, in the long process of bringing Geshech 3 to a state of publication. He's also the co-editor of the text, made sure that Rodrigo and I didn't get into too much trouble. I'm very happy to welcome to the podium Jeffrey Bennington, who will be speaking us today in a title that reads a little bit like a Ceylon poem, Geschlecht, Holocaust Legatai, Derrida's Heidegger and Aristotle. Welcome. Katie, thank you for being here. Let me start by thanking um, Katie especially, not just for organizing this event, but for making this um, event possible in the sense that this is the first uh, Derrida publication uh, since his death to be um, published by the Edition du Seuil in Paris as opposed to the Edition Galilee. This is a new departure in the, um, in the process of publishing the unpublished seminars and other um, unpublished posthumous works. It's, it's a big deal. It's a big improvement. Things will appear much more rapidly they're much cheaper. Uh, there'll be a, a, a much greater flow of material coming through in French and thereafter shortly in English. So a big thanks for Katie, who's also, as I'm sure you know, making great things happen here at Princeton around Derrida's library and watch this space for further announcements to do with archival material and access to them. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Rodrigo, who was the um, guiding uh, light behind the project to publish this particular volume in the form in which you see it. It's not a whole seminar, it's part of a seminar for very good reasons associated with the lecture that Derrida gave. It enters into a sequence of um, texts mysteriously titled with this German work, the Schlecht. Rodrigo, of course, is following in David Krell's persistent and path-breaking, I think is uh, the word for it, footsteps. Um, but when either if you read this in French or you wait for the English translation, you also see that Rodrigo's provided a really um, admirable and exemplary preface um, in every way. So thanks to both of them. I'd also like to thank my old friend Peggy, um, for many things, but especially for just now using many of the quotations that I was <laughs> um, planning to use and talking about them in a way which was, of course, much more elegant and cheerful, um, perhaps, than the way I'm going to be um, speaking about them. Um, I have a number of um, initial quotations which I won't read out. And I may skip some of the other quotations depending on time and cheerfulness. Um, so I'll just um, start the paper now. Geschlecht is said in many ways. As is perhaps a little perversely most clearly brought out through the trial of translation from German into French and then into English, Geschlecht means in a retranslation into English of Derrida's initial list from Geschlecht 1, that I think was the earliest slide. Sex, genus or gender, family, stock, race, lineage, generation. In that same quotation, Derrida refers to this multiplicity of meanings as a richesse polysémique, a polysémic wealth or richness. In the somewhat mysterious intermediate version of the text of Geschlecht 3, discovered by Rodrigo in the archive, text we presume comes somewhere between the seminar 
materials and the so-called Loyola TypeScript, the TypeScript of the lecture page for that day of conference, Gehida writes the following, I don't have this on a slide. Ne que veut dire geschlecht, sex, race, espèce, genre, famille, souche, etc. Pretty much the same list as before. Et d'abord, type, mot qui renvoie mieux à tuptain frappé. Rodrigo quoted this this morning. And first of all, type, a word which refers better to Greek word tuptain to strike. In the text published as Geschlecht 2, Derrida gives a slightly different list in a slightly different order. Now giving the candidate translations definite articles. He you now refers to la souche, la race, la famille, l'espèce, le genre, la génération, le sexe. And goes so far as to suggest that this multiplicity of meanings is held together insofar as it's held together at all only by the word Geschlecht, by the signifier Geschlecht, which then seems to mean that its very status as a word and indeed even as a signifier, I think Daniel said this this morning, is cast into doubt. If that is a word, it's a word only insofar as it can be tethered to a meaning, a signifier, a signifier, only insofar as it can be tethered to a signifier. So perhaps Geschlecht is not even a word not even a signifier, merely a mark, as Derrida calls it, and a mark that if we take seriously, Heidegger's reading of it is entailing a schlag, a mark that remarks its own status as a mark, or a stamp, or an imprint. Heidegger himself, translating German into German, as it were, according to a process he thematizes, for example, in his famous 1942 course on Hölderlin in Der Easter, thank you Peggy, <laughs> twice in the Tarkel essay explicitly unpacks the senses of Geschlecht initially as follows. I'm going to give it first and show it first in the inevitably more or less incomprehensible English translation by Peter Dean Hertz. A human caste, cast in one mold and cast away into this caste, is called a kin of a kind, a generation. Those three words translate the single German word, Geschlecht. The word refers to mankind as a whole, as well as to kinship in the sense of race, tribe, family, all of these in turn cast in the duality of the sexes. Now here the admittedly impossible task of translating Heidegger's German begins by simply omitting Heidegger's remarking of the fact of German, of unsere Sprache, which disappears entirely in the translation, and thus misses a crucial point for Derrida's reading. You can see Heidegger's text there beginning, I won't um, hurt your ears with my German pronunciation, but beginning with unsere Sprache. It's true, of course, maybe somewhat in defense of Hertz's translation, that this simple marking or remarking by and in a language of the language that it is, here by the use of that expression, Unterersprache, is the very example of the radically untranslatable. This is an untranslatable and translatability that's not just an extension of difficulty in translation. Anybody can translate Unterersprache as our language. The problem doesn't lie there, it lies elsewhere on a different level. Derrida points this type of untranslatability out elsewhere around about the same time, early 1980s, in relation to the translation of the Discours de la Méthode into Latin, and the translator's choice simply to omit from the Latin version Descartes' explanation of why the text is written in French. And Derrida here talks about a kind of suicide by translation, that's his expression, uh, a suicide of the idiomatic moment at which a language points to itself as itself, in itself, in this way. This kind of suicide by translation happens a lot in Hertz's English translation of Heidegger's title <laughs> essay. And indeed, he seems to have taken a decision, uh, a principle, simply to omit or change quite radically pretty much every occasion on which Heidegger's German explicitly remarks itself as German, or as Derrida puts it, when Heidegger 
tout en se tenant ou en revenant vers le lieu d'origine, opère déjà une traduction périphote de truc à l'intérieur de l'allemand, des allemands de différents âges, de différentes générations, au vieil allemand, allemand moderne, code philosophique, code courant, etc. Heidegger opère déjà une sorte de va-et-vient traducteur germano-germain. Derrida goes on immediately to make a claim, it carries on on the slide there, that if, it, if true would mean that the English translation of this text is in a fairly strict sense unreadable and unusable, as it certainly is on its own for purposes such as ours here today. C'est ce va-et-vient son explication en allemand moderne au courant de ce que le haut vieil allemand voulait dire qui nous permet de traduire en français et de parler comme je le fais. C'est parce qu'Heidegger se livre à cette traduction vers ou depuis le sens originaire, de sens que des Allemands peuvent déjà le lire à supposer qu'ils le fassent. So if we simply relied on the Hertz translation that removes pretty much, not everyone, but almost all such moments um, in Heidegger's text, we wouldn't be able to read it according to Derrida's reasoning. Towards the end of the Trakel essay, commenting on the emphatic Ein of Eingeschlecht, and coming back for a second and last time, he only does it twice, to the different senses of that word, Heidegger gives a slightly different sequence while explicitly referring to that earlier unpacking of the term from which I began. So I'll give it first again, in fact I give them both together on the slide, in Hertz's English, the word generation, it's an odd choice for the, for the leading term. Uh, even in a translation that's obviously up against it, dealing with Heidegger. Uh, there are a number of unpromising single candidates. You remember earlier, as I said, he resorted to um, kin of a kind generation. He chooses generation. The word generation here retains the full manifold meaning mentioned earlier. For one thing, it names the historical generation of man. Mankind is distinct from all other living beings, plants and animals. Of course, in English, generation names no such thing. Um, next, the word generation names the races, tribes, clans, and families of mankind. At the same time, the word always refers to the twofoldness of the sexes, which the word generation does not. So, Geschlecht is indeed said in many ways, but those many ways are not, as it were, all on the same level. I forgot to mention, I was going to quote a little moment from Derrida's book on Joyce, where he says in a footnote, let's never speak ill of translations. And it's a lesson I really have tried hard to learn. <laughs> so, Geschlecht is indeed said in many ways, but those many ways are not, as it were, all on the same level. Geschlecht in its initial spread, as Heidegger gives it, in what looks like a fairly clearly ordered or hierarchized, almost lineal form, something like in an order of decreasing generality, genus, species, stock, tribe, family, is set over against Geschlecht in the binary terms of sex or gender, the Zwiefeld of the two sexes or gender, and the second type of meaning of Geschlecht, what Heidegger will characterize as the second schlag that comes to overprint or overtype the first, affects then in return all the terms of that first lineal spread so that each of those terms, genus, species, and so on, is, as Heidegger's German has it, wiederum, de nouveau, in French, in turn, supplementarily, as Derrida will gloss it in that mysterious intermediate version, is struck by the gender distinction that Heidegger's Trakel will characterize as a curse or a malediction. Now, this quite complex, but not obviously unmasterable, disordered, or crazy, multiplicity of the word or mark Geschlecht, thematized as such, will in due course be the occasion for Derrida to wield a pair of terms from his own semi-technical vocabulary. It will turn out that the value of polysemia, which as we saw he used in Geschlecht 1, and indeed also in Of Spirit, where Derrida says in passing that Geschlecht is a word that is redoutablement polysémique, so formidably 
polysemia. We'll see that this value of polysemia that he on occasion appeals to is itself cast into doubt by those same features of Gishlech that according to Gishlech too, like his hand, make it perhaps not even a word, but more of a mark. And so the concept of polysemia needs to be, in Derrida's view, to be displaced or complicated by his own notion of dissemination. So in the ninth session of the seminar from which Geschlecht three has been extracted, Derrida writes the following in preparation for discussion of what Heidegger in his essay calls Mehr Deutlichkeit. Si je me sers du mot dissémination, ce n'est pas pour recentrer les choses vers un certain mot que j'ai naguère privilégié et qui nous souffle, souffle ce recentrement, c'est pour mieux faire paraître un rapport que je crois nécessaire entre la scène du Geschlecht comme scène à la fois sexuelle et généalogique, d'engendrement et de génération d'une part, et la question plus étroitement langagière qui s'abrite dans le couple impossible que j'appelle dissémination polysémique. Now this privileging of the word dissemination, which strictly speaking Derrida probably shouldn't by his own rights refer to as either a word or as we'll see him doing in a moment a concept. His recent use of it he invokes here is presumably referring to the 1972 volume of that title, La Dissemination. And within it, the eponymous essay about Philippe Celeste that I suspect no one much reads these days. Or perhaps for a shorthand, you might be referring to the very trenchant, slightly earlier remarks from the famous essay Signature Event Context, where obviously simplifying, he first, he Derrida first describes himself as opposing dissemination to policy, <coughs> can't possibly be in opposition, and then suggests the need to écarter, to separate out or place at a distance what he, at that point, indeed calls the concept of dissemination from that of polysemia, before finally, in the closing pages of the essay, glossing dissemination as an <coughs> irreducible polysemia in the discussion of Austin. Now, in spite of some appearances, which I think are largely misleading, misleading appearances that include Derrida's own summary of G3, at the end of G2, at the end of Heidegger's hand. So in spite of those appearances, Derrida's mobilization of the concept or mark dissemination in reading Heidegger is not in fact directly to do with the latter's understanding or interlingual translation, intralingual translation of the word or concept or mark Fischler at all. Heidegger at the end of his essay no longer talking about the many senses of Geschlecht. I don't think Derrida ever contests the list that Heidegger provides of those putative many senses. But pursuing the more general question, this is Heidegger at the end of his essay, pursuing the more general question on quoting, of what sort then is the language of Tarkov's poetic work? Affirms an essential ambiguity or plurivocity in the language of Tarkov's poetry, described as Wesenhaft Merdeutig, which Merdeutigkeit he initially derives from the structure of Abgeschiedenheit, Abgeschiedenheit that had previously been advanced as the word that best characterizes the unspoken singular Gedicht that all of Truffle's poems are supposedly <coughs> speaking. Through a quite complex and even quite confusing sequence, that Derrida does not entirely reconstruct, and neither will I for lack of time, Heidegger generates his notion of mehr Deutigkeit broadly as follows. <coughs> All the major terms we have been discussing in this essay are zweideutig, two-sided, ambiguous. But that preliminary two-sidedness is itself only one side of the true mehr Deutigkeit Heidegger is trying to characterize, which mehr Deutigkeit seems to consist in a kind of second level zweideutigkeit, one of the sides of which is the first level zweideutigkeit, and the other side of which is determined by, says Heidegger, the innermost side of the Gedicht that Heidegger has characterized in terms of the Abgeschiedenheit, Abgeschiedenheit from which he started his discussion 
of Mir Deutsch's page earlier. It's a diabolical page. It's extremely hard to follow the movement of Heidegger's argument. Only after that initial claim has led to this more complex Zweideutig, Zweideutigkeit, as Heidegger calls it, so I'm ambiguous ambiguity, two-sided, two-sidedness. Only then does Heidegger contrast the Mehrdeutigkeit that supposedly is produced by that Zweideutig, Zweideutigkeit. Only then does he contrast it with what Derrida will describe as a Heideggerian and indeed classical understanding of dissemination, such that for Heidegger this Mehrdeutigkeit does not devolve into indeterminate Vieldeutigkeit. There are three terms in play here. Zweideutigkeit, usually translated as ambiguity. Mehrdeutigkeit, which probably Paulus Senior is Derrida's best shot at that. And Vieldeutigkeit, which is going to be the bad version of dissemination Derrida is going to criticize Heidegger for <coughs> describing in this way. So um, the Mehrdeutigkeit says Heidegger does not devolve into indeterminate Vieldeutigkeit. It does not scatter in vague equivocations, as the English translation has it. Or as Derrida says in his French gloss, cette pluralité, I think I have this on the slide, leading into some further things. Cette pluralité de sens du dire poétique ne s'épartit pas, ne se dissémine pas, ne devient pas et passe dans le vent de ci, de là, d'une polyvalence indéterminable. And then a little later he goes on, la polysémie, mais d'autre de ce dire poétique n'est pas, dit avec une sorte de mépris évident, n'est pas das ungenau des lessigen, l'imprécision et l'inexactitude, le flou, du laisser aller de la nonchalance de la souciance, mais la rigueur du laisser être. Heidegger oppose le laisser aller au laisser être, qui a consenti au souci, au scrupule de la gerechten Anschauung. Citation, this is part of Derrida's quotation, citation de la juste vision et si à joint ou si à juste. Now this is where Aristotle is pressed into service by Derrida as a way of taking some distance from Heidegger's contrasting his good Mehrdeutigkeit or polysemia to this bad version of dissemination. Here's Derrida. Par un geste que je trouve pour ma part très classique, voix aristotélicien, je dirai pourquoi dans un instant, Adéguin n'imagine pas d'autre alternative que celle d'une polysémie rassemblée ou rassemblante dans l'unité de ton du Gedicht, poésie de rigueur, et d'autre part une dispersion négligée, floue, sans lieu ensemble, celle de l'indétermination du n'importe quoi de la multiplicité irréductible des temps et du sens qui, pour Heidegger, ne peut relever que du laisser aller. Il ne peut pas y avoir de pensée ou d'écriture poétique rigoureuse de la dissémination. On s'en just now quoted by Peggy. Now, Derrida here seems, not just here, perhaps more generally in Gustav III and beyond, seems to be playing gotcha with Heidegger. He seems to be quite pleased with himself. A little, je trouve pour ma part, is not a gesture of modesty. <laughs> I, I find. Um, to be quite pleased with himself for catching Heidegger out being classical and even Aristotelian. Aristotle being apparently the very example of what it is to be classical. In the summary at the end of Heidegger's hand, Derrida says that Heidegger's gesture is proprement Aristotelian, properly Aristotelian, which is interesting in and of itself, given that Derrida's arguably most sustained published engagement with Aristotle in La Mythologie Blanche is centered on this very notion of the propre as itself already fundamentally Aristotelian. The propre uh, coming from Aristotle's term idion, which is of course the root of idiom, which we were also talking about earlier. Um, an odd thing for Derrida to call this proprement Aristotelien, or Aristotelicien, given that um, La Mythologie Blanche is centered on this very notion of the propre as itself already fundamentally Aristotelian. So calling Heidegger's gesture proprement Aristotelicien is already, we might think, a strangely Aristotelian thing for Derrida to do. <coughs> 
Now, it's not exactly that Aristotle, any more than does Heidegger, denounces polysemia as such. C'est que pour Aristotle, la polysémie est acceptable. Un mot et donc tout ce qui se fait avec les mots, phrase, texte, peut avoir plusieurs sens à la condition que cette pluralité soit ordonnée, unifiable, qu'elle ait en tant que pluralité de sens un foyer de sens. Sans quoi, dit Aristote, par exemple la métaphysique gamma, hein, ne pas signifier une chose unique, c'est ne pas signifier du tout. There's already something a little strange about the relation between these two sentences in that the quote from the metaphysics as glossed by Derrida in the second sentence with its slightly odd opening sans quoi would seem to rule out the very polysemia that the first sentence seems to concede. If Aristotle really thought that ne pas signifier une chose unique c'est ne pas signifier du tout, then it's difficult to see how he could allow even for the plusieurs sens that Derrida says Aristotle can tolerate. In fact, this very same passage of the metaphysics, given with a lot more context and commentary, was already quoted at length by Derrida during his famous and brilliant reading of Aristotle in La Mythologie Blanche. Here Derrida introduces the quotation from the metaphysics, the same quotation given in a much uh, more extended version, with a preliminary gloss that seems to be making the same point he's making in G3. Un nom est propre quand il n'a qu'un seul sens. Mieux, c'est seulement dans ce sens qu'il est proprement un nom. L'université est l'essence ou mieux le telos du langage. Cet idéal aristotélicien, aucune philosophie en tant que telle n'y a jamais renoncé. Il est la philosophie. Aristote reconnaît qu'un mot peut avoir plusieurs sens, c'est un fait, mais ce fait n'a droit de langage que dans la mesure où la polysémie est finie, où les différentes significations sont en nombre limité et surtout assez distinctes, chacune restant une et identifiable. Le langage n'est ce qu'il est, langage, que pour autant qu'il peut alors maîtriser et analyser la polysémie. Sans reste, une dissémination non maîtrisable n'est même pas une polysémie, elle appartient au dehors du langage. And then I'll skip the next quote, which is a bit long, but it's part of the commentary from La Mythologie Blanche, where it goes on to show that whenever polysemia is irreducible, then we're not just outside language, we're outside humanity. Um, at the very least, we're sophists rather than philosophers. And um, if we persist in uh, arguing for an irreducible plurality of meaning, we may as well be plants. That's what the end of the quote says here. Now, these are famous passages from Book Gamma of the Metaphysics. And they seem themselves satisfyingly univocal in their affirmation of the telos of university and the necessary reducibility of polysemia. But they sit in a relationship that might stand further clarification with Aristotle's equally famous, oft-repeated slogan, though not so much by Derrida himself, who I think only ever addresses it in his essay on Benveniste, the supplement of Copula, and there, a little inaccurately, in fact, the oft-repeated slogan, namely, being is said in many ways, to on polakos legatai, a slogan that Heidegger himself spends a good deal of time unpacking in detail, fascinating detail, in a 1931 course on book Theta of the Metaphysics. The recognition of the reality of polysemia in Aristotle is in fact usually negotiated not simply by the demand that words have one and only one meaning, as Derrida seems to suggest here and elsewhere, <laughs> but rather by a structure usually referred to by Aristotle with the words pros, hen, with reference to one. This is what Derrida is reflecting when in the G2 summary he says in the triple text, Heidegger thématise à la fois la polysémie et la simplicité focale de Gesellschaft dans notre langue. So Heidegger thématises both the polysemia and the focal simplicity of the word Gesellschaft in our language. And this simplicité focale, or what in the other passage I quoted earlier from Heidegger's hand, um, calls a foyer de sens, again a focus of meaning. Uh, that's a notion Derrida appeals to elsewhere. 
seems indeed to gesture towards the notion of focal meaning that became in the Aristotle scholarship from the 60s onwards a dominant way of understanding the relationship between the poikos legomenon in Aristotle and the need somehow to get on top of that multiplicity to prevent it getting out of hand without, however, reducing it quite as directly and brutally as Dehida seems to suggest to the simplicity of one and only one meaning. <coughs> earlier attempts, quick sidebar, earlier attempts to understand this in Aristotle typically focused on the notion of analogy, now thought, I think, to be a, a red herring in this context. It's an interesting, what the man would have called an interesting aberration in the tradition of commentary on Aristotle through the scholastics up at least to Brentano, leaving some traces in Heidegger and indeed in Dehinger himself. This notion of analogy is not what's at play in the prosen structure of understanding the, the many ways in which being, not just being, um, can be said. Now the exact grounds for that description in terms of focus or focal simplicity, the prosen, and not in fact present in the passage from Metaphysics Gamma that Derrida relies on both in G3 and in La Mythologie Blanche to establish Aristotle's position on meaning. But they do become clearer in Aristotle's treatment elsewhere in the metaphysics of what he often describes in terms of homonymy, in situations where terms are what he would say non-contingently homonymous, so not merely factitious homonyms such as bank in the sense of a financial institution and bank in the sense of a river bank. Those aren't very interesting for Aristotle. So in situations where terms are um, homonymous but not in that merely contingent way, the pros hen structure, the reference to one structure, the principle of what was indeed habitually called in the scholarship focal meaning, nowadays it's more often referred to as core-dependent homonymy provides for both a recognition of the reality of the polypos legomenon and a way of organizing that multiplicity so that there is, says Aristotle in one of its favorite illustrative examples, some relation we might be able to specify between the different senses of the word healthy as used of, say, a diet, an appetite, an exercise, a <coughs> complexion, or a lifestyle, uh, when Heidegger's discussing this example in Aristotle, he adds the example of a healthy thrashing to the list, which I'll let you interpret as you will. These uses are not synonymous. The word health or healthy does not mean exactly the same thing in all of those cases, but nor is their homonymy contingent, like those two senses of bank. And perhaps Geschlecht could be thought of as a homonymy in this Aristotelian cross sense. So this way of dealing with um, a certain kind of multiplicity of meaning seems to be slightly less absolutist in its demand for unicity of meaning than Derrida seems to suggest in his invocation of the passage he quotes in both La Mythologie Blanche and in G3, and possibly even leaves open the extent to which even terms like focus or core would be the appropriate terms with which to understand it. So family resemblance in a Wittgensteinian sense might be another less restrictive possibility that would certainly resonate in our current context. This way of thinking about the polycos opens a little space in which it might be possible and interesting to give Aristotle a slightly more generous reading than Derrida here or indeed typically gives him. I don't think there's any real example in Derrida's treatment of Aristotle of the kind of reading he devotes to Plato in Plato's Pharmacy, to which he indeed alludes here in G3, where he's able to bring out through, again, a brilliant reading of Plato not reducible to the Plato of Platonism. If I could put things a little brutally in the interest of time, Derrida most often seems to line up Aristotle with the Plato of Platonism not the alternative Plato he brings out in Plato's Pharmacy, and has them equally grounding the metaphysics of presence, as though the possibility of opening a space between Aristotle and Aristotelianism were not of any interest to him, as though Aristotle were always and univocally proprement aristotelicien. Now this has some virtues of simplicity, but it argue, arguably buys that simplicity at the price of reducing Aristotle's persistent critique of Plato to a merely epiphenomenal status in the history of Western metaphysics, 
as a metaphysics of presence. And insofar as Heidegger, at least in his early work, is much more persistent and careful in his dealings with Aristotle, this sense that Derrida's Aristotle is perhaps a little simplified might have some relevance to Derrida's dealings with Heidegger and suggests some rereading done, of course, in a Derridian spirit, a spirit explicitly formulated in G3 here, where Derrida suggests that for Heidegger to be so confident in denying the place of Platonico-Christian concepts in Tarkov, il faut présupposer que ces concepts, I skipped the first quote on this one, il faut présupposer que ces concepts ont un sens univoque ou sont d'une plurivacité dominable, rassemblable, que ces concepts de la théologie, de la métaphysique et de la dogmatique ont aussi un lieu qui soit un, un lieu qui soit un, et depuis lequel on puisse dire « ce n'est pas le lieu de Tarkov ». And he goes on to say « Mais que se passerait-il si on n'était pas d'accord sur ce point, si on récusait cette présupposition, si on disait « Il n'y a pas un seul lieu pour cette chose dite la métaphysique ou la théologie » ou encore si on veut accéder au lieu des textes d'où procèdent les textes dits métaphysiques ou chrétiens. Il faut cesser de croire à une certaine université et les lire comme on lit Tracol en leur faisant le même crédit. Now, Derrida's criticisms of Heidegger's supposed Aristotelianism are not matched in G3 itself by any positive account of what he, Derrida, understands by dissemination. If that dissemination is not to be thought in the negative terms that Heidegger proposes as the mere scatter of vague equivocations, a laissez aller without any unifying principle. So we have to look elsewhere for the possibility of that rigorous thought of dissemination that Derrida appears to be laying claim to as against the Heideggerian negative version of it. Now, even if G3 doesn't give us much help in that respect, Derrida's use of the word dissemination is, of course, an object of explicit reflection in a number of places. Most clearly, perhaps, near the beginning of the third eponymous interview collected in Positions in 1972. The interview itself dates from 1971. We're not going to read this whole quote. In the second part of it, si on ne peut résumer la dissémination, la différence séminale dans sa teneur conceptuelle, c'est que la force et la forme de sa destruction crèvent l'horizon sémantique. But it's just a verb he uses of dissemination three times in signature event context as well. It's a, it's a pretty violent verb, uh, dissemination bursts <coughs> open, crèvent l'horizon. Um, it, it's Derrida's italics as well. La dissémination, au contraire, pour produire un nombre non fini d'effets sémantiques, ne se laisse reconduire ni à un présent d'origine simple, ni à une présence eschatologique. Elle marque une multiplicité irréductible et générative. And again, similarly, I work with the whole court from the eponymous essay La dissémination en Philippe Solers. Um, again, a distancing from um, polysemia. Polysemia always working within the domain of meaning. Tous les moments de la polysémie sont, comme le nom l'indique, les moments du sens. La différence entre la polysémie du discours et la dissémination textuelle. Another difference is uh, polysémie happens in discourse, dissemination happens in text. C'est précisément les différences. Celle-ci est sans doute indispensable à la production du sens. And a curious parenthesis is that pourquoi entre la polysémie and la dissemination, the difference is très petite. But en tant qu'ils se present, se rassemble, se dit, se tient là, le sens les face et la repousse. Le sémantique a pour condition la structure, le différentiel, mais il n'est pas lui-même en lui-même structural. Le séminal, au contraire, se dissémine sans avoir jamais été lui-même et sans retour à soi. <coughs> So what I think becomes clearer here is that dissemination and polysemia are not to be located at the same level at all, as it were. And perhaps that's why in the quote from G3, Derrida refers to them as a coup impossible. <coughs> so although he writes here that, as we saw, entre la polysemie et la dissemination, la différence est très petite, that very small difference is also immense, or better, it involves just a radical incommensurability, that means there is simply no way of quantifying the difference between them. <laughs>
semantics, the domain of possible polysemia, has structure, what he here calls the differential, as its condition, without itself, at least in its own view of itself, in the semantics, of the word semantics, without itself being structural or differential. If polysemia is a semantic value, dissemination, far from being the disorganized meaning scatter that Derrida's Heidegger thinks it is, is a syntactic value. Derrida is also explicit about this at the end of La Mythologie Blanche, where he talks about a supplement de résistance syntaxique, a supplement of syntactic resistance, and still more emphatic about it in the reading of Malafme in the double session in the book La Dissemination, where he firmly subordinates the semantic values even of the word hymen, which seem to be doing so much deconstructive work, he subordinates the semantic values even of that word to the syntactic values signaled by the word between, alt, and goes on to refer to, quoting from uh, dissemination, the irreducible excess of the syntactic over the semantic. So the putatively rigorous account of dissemination does not really rely on an exacerbated polysemia at all. And so describing it in terms of unmasterable or irreducible polysemia doesn't quite seem to capture what's at stake. Rather, dissemination thought in a rigorously Derridian way seems to require the inscription of what I'm going to call a quasi-semantic placeholder that signifies or remarks in a supplementary way the play of syntax, what we here call syntax, the differential in general, just the trace, if you like, as the non-semantic condition of semantic effects. And I think we can confirm that configuration in the discussion in part two of the double session of Jean-Pierre Richard's thematic reading of Mallarmé. You'll remember that a crucial part of that reading involves <coughs> pointing out that certain supposed themes Exemplarily for Derrida, the themes of blanc and pli, blank, white or blank, and fold, are not merely two themes or motifs among others, nor even, as Richard would think, exceptionally important themes that might be plausibly thought to be superordinate with respect to other themes. The point about them is that they also remark, Derrida's term, the relation of all the supposed themes among themselves such that blanc or blank also refers to the blanks or gaps, the spacing between all the other themes that allow them to appear as identical themes in their relative semantic dispersion. It turns out, I really don't have time to show this here, that the very term dissemination itself, and indeed all the other terms that Derrida <coughs> often places it in relation to, like Difference, writing, pharmacon, and so on, um, are, them, are themselves examples of themselves in this respect. They don't just name that uh, condition of the um, excess of syntax over semantics. They are indeed examples uh, of the use of a quasi-semantic placeholder to describe that very structure. Now, at least on occasion, Derrida presents dissemination understood in this way as involving not so much a semantic superabundance but a certain poverty or monotony. Contesting Jean-Pierre Richard's reading of a kind of semantic copia, corny copia almost, in uh, perhaps a mere doitish kind, in Mallarmé's motifs of the fold and the blank, Derrida writes this, Le pli donc et le blanc, qui nous interdiront de chercher un terme ou un sens total au-delà des instances textuelles dans un imaginaire, une intentionnalité ou un vécu. Richard voit dans le blanc et dans le pli des thèmes d'une plurivalence particulièrement féconde ou exubérante. Ce qu'on ne voit pas dans l'abondance de son relevé, c'est que ses effets de texte sont riches par une pauvreté. Je dirais presque une monotonie très singulière, très régulière aussi. On ne le voit pas parce qu'on croit voir des thèmes au lieu où le non-thème, ce qui ne peut devenir thème, cela même qui n'a pas de sens, se remarque sans cesse, c'est-à-dire disparaît. So, blanc and pli are not only themes, or at least can be misrecognized as themes, and perhaps cannot but be so misrecognized, but more especially the relatively monotonous remarking of what makes a theme both possible and impossible, so that Derrida in the same text can write 
I'm quoting, s'il y a un système textuel, un thème n'existe pas. If there is a textual system, a theme does not exist. The monotony of this system textuel cannot, of course, be exhibited as such. A quick version of why is that la trace n'arrive qu'à s'effacer. The trace cannot present itself as such only in other traces. But it's brought out indirectly, sorry, it's brought out or indirectly indicated by a reading process that identifies what I call those quasi-semantic placeholders. And it may be that the most promising or memorable of those placeholders, supplement writing, Différence, Pharmacon, perhaps now Geschlecht, do exhibit some of the features that, from a semantic point of view, might be considered polysemic, but this does not seem to be an essential feature of them at all. The syntax remarked by those placeholders can be taken in an extremely broad sense, that of language in general, or more often the language of the metaphysical tradition, but perhaps also something more specific, and as Derrida probably would say and does say many times, idiomatic, for example, in La Mythologie Blanche, he uses the notions of syntax and grammar in that sense to identify a relative specificity of the way that Descartes, for example, <coughs> mobilizes the metaphoristy of light. It's not unique to Descartes, but Descartes' way of organizing that metaphoristy is, uh, is unique in the sense of idiomatic. which may yet invite a closer comparison than Derrida might want with what Heidegger calls the singular, unique, or as we might say, relatively monotonous, Gedicht of a great poet. That monotony may not be something we would want to identify with anything like Richard's rich Univers Imaginaire of Mallarmé, but we might still wonder if the monos of the monotonous remark does not invite rereading against all the unifying or gathering motifs that Derrida is so suspicious of in Heidegger, and even whether that kind of monotony, <coughs> writing, textuality, trace, dissemination, différence, but also everywhere by suicide, by translation beckons, whether that kind of monotony is really so clearly distinguishable from what Heidegger repeatedly characterizes in terms of oneness, unity, uniqueness, Einklang, and so on. Just a couple of minutes in conclusion. In that more generous reading of Aristotle that I was suggesting Derrida makes possible, but never really pursues, I look forward to exploring the fact that one of the major terms described as a parkos legomenon by Aristotle is precisely tohen, the one. So the multiple saying of which, or the many sayings of which, a whole book, this book Iota of the Metaphysics, is devoted. I was wishing this morning when Daniel was speaking I'd had the excellent idea of rereading the Shibboleth text, where the um, in Eins, of course, would start resonating with this point clearly. And I also, before I wrote this, should have taken a closer look at the photograph that's on the um, program of this conference, where you'll see on the blackboard over to the right hand side, Derrida has written Das Ein, in quotes. Das Ein is Tohen uh, in, in Greek. Um, Aristotle has a whole book talking about the many ways in which the one is said. And we might think, pure hypothesis on my part at this point, working hypothesis, that once the one is said in many ways, then the whole logic of the pros hen as a way of finding some kind of order in the multiplicity of the polacos is complicated by something like, an, like a fold, an abyssal, fractal self-similarity, whereby each time the cross head seems to be reaching towards the one, that one opens up a new polacos, and so on, indefinitely. And read this way, the cross head would not be as irredeemably teleological as most interpretations would have it, and the Platonizing and Christianizing tendencies of Aristotel Aristotelianism might be understood as a process whereby just that abyssal complexity would be what is being reduced out of Aristotle. And that reduction would then be a crucial part of the very construction of what, of a tradition of what we now, since Heidegger and Derrida, call the metaphysics of presence. This Polakos legatai of the one, 
might then, in a reading of Aristotle that would not be mortgaged to Aristotelianism, resonate with Derrida's own apparently non-Aristotelian and non-Heideggerian understanding of the one. Remember his slogans, l'un se fait violence, l'un se garde de l'autre. It would also have effects on our understanding of political theology, so that Derrida's rapid alignment in rogues, for example, of Aristotle and Plato, in terms of their supposedly common political salute to the one God, would certainly bear some further deconstructive attention. And it might also have effects on one of, on the most famous Polycos legomenon of all, the multiple saying of being itself, including perhaps Heidegger's saying of being and his readings of Aristotle in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> just a passing remark, um, that little re remark that you quoted from the text on joys, two words for joys, I think, right? Um, uh, let's never speak ill of translation. Um, I mean, that's repeated, including uh, about the Beaufray tra translation. As I said, I didn't quote that, but he's quite uh, fulsome, and not in the praise of the translation, but recognizing the, the debt of the reader. Um, and I think also importantly recognizing, and, and, as you pointed out, a difference between translating and the, in, the, in the usual right. sense which right. is based on the word-to-word -word equivalence, which I completely believe in, which is why I'm so disapproving of that use of many terms to translate only one, as Hertz does in the first passage that I gave, um, and making a distinction between that impossible task, which we all know is impossible, and the kind of explicating multiplying... Right, right. Um, which is what he's doing in that note, saying, you know, so, but I think that that, that gesture of, of acknowledging the, the um, I mean, he calls it a gift, the gift that the translators He's have, also, have course, given, and it, it's very frequent. I mean, even he, as he goes on to be rather savage, as we saw. So, uh, speaking ill of a translation is one thing. Criticizing it virulently seems to be another, because he certainly does that. That is right. it too. Right. Um, and on occasion, at least, suggests ways that it might have been better translated. Even though sometimes, in the in the usual, in the narrow sense, even though sometimes he, as he says, multiplies the possibilities <coughs> and also tries to come at the difficulty in a different kind of way. So let's say that we could make a distinction on the basis of what he's saying between speaking ill of a translation and criticizing a translation. Make me feel better about myself. Uh, Jeff, two, <coughs> two requests for something more. I'm not able to follow when you talk about the eminence of syntax over semantics as playing a role seems to me paratax, I could understand, the paratactic, okay, in Adorno sense. But I don't understand what you mean by a kind of eminence of syntaxis in the diminution of semantics. I can understand the impossible position of semantics, but yeah, why are you talking that, about syntax? That's not me, that's Derrida, right? He's explicit. Well, then why is he saying? <laughs> He's saying it partly because he wants to wield, as he says, the resources of contemporary linguistics, of which, of course, is very critical. But everything in contemporary linguistics that foregrounds syntax at the expense of semantics, which is how he sees those movements at that time, encourages him to think that there's something about a non-semantic condition of semantics that can, he can at least gesture towards. I don't think he thinks syntax is the proper name for it. But by syntax, he seems to mean a principle of organization that is not itself semantizable or, or um, could be brought into a kind of thematic 
um, content like view. So what do you would otherwise call structure? What do you call structure? The differential, the trace, right? These are all non-synonymous substitutions, as he would say. Um, for what perhaps it's a shorthand, I usually just call the movement of the trace or the logic of the trace, but all the other terms are just as, are just as good as trace. And those then function as those quasi-semantic placeholders. I can't exhibit the trace. I can't show you the trace. But I can use the word trace, which then has certain semantic variances attached to it, as a way of gesturing towards something that's not exhaustively semantizable or reducible to the realm of meaning in Derrida's view. So I think that's, that's the place of syntax in that moment of his work. I'm not sure it goes on for very much longer, but it's a, it's a reasonably stark way that's absolutely associated with dissemination, with his concept, quasi-concept of dissemination, as a way of withdrawing dissemination from any kind of symmetry with polysemia. So what seems to be, to me, in G3 to be less clear is that lack of symmetry or that incommensurability between polysemia on the one hand and dissemination on the other. Once we don't think of dissemination in the kind of way he chides Heidegger for thinking about it as just a kind of bigger scatter or more of a scatter than polysemia. His own descriptions of where he's trying to be rigorous and he is laying claim to that rigorous thought of dissemination seem essentially to involve this appeal to the notion of trace, dissemination, text, and so on that doesn't seem as if it can be lined up in any simple way, and that's why it's an impossible couple, with the polysemia term. Um, so it's strange that in, in G3 he, he brings that term into play, uh, but he only ever gives it the kind of negative characterization he imagines Heidegger would give it as a kind of method de quoi, and doesn't give it the positive characterization for which I went back to the essay of that name and the interview positions, and what comes back from that sits in an extremely strange relationship with polysemia. And quite often it seems like this is something that I could look at every instance of his use of that pair of terms, and certainly in some cases he makes it sound as though <coughs> all dissemination is, is a bit more polysemia, or polysemia gone beyond a certain limit. It seems like it's nothing like that at all. Uh, if we take him seriously and we go for the rigorous thinking of him. Um, and at that point, various possibilities open up, including the fact that however interesting we might be, however interested we might be in the polysemia of the term Geschlecht, it doesn't seem immediately self-evident that that polysemia doesn't belong in the realm of polysemia. Mm -hmm doesn't seem self-evident that it exceeds it in this bursting of the horizon way towards dissemination. Maybe it does, but it's not immediately obvious to me that it doesn't. And in that not obviousness of its exceeding polysemia, the suggestion would be maybe it's just a polycos in the Aristotelian sense. Maybe there is a focal meaning. It doesn't seem that hard to imagine, just as Aristotle says, healthy this, healthy that all relate to some kind of something that pulls them together. It's not as if the senses of Geschlecht seem to be wild, wildly dispersed or unrelated to each other. <coughs> it seems as if there's a definite <coughs> organization of some sort, or what Heidegger would probably call a gathering. It seems like there is some kind of gathering involved, at which point it becomes a little less clear to me exactly what's in play in Derrida's foregrounding of that term so persistently, and in a sense is apparently trying to take it away from Heidegger, or at least to take it away from Heidegger's understanding of mere Deutschkeit, further complicated by the fact that Heidegger's not talking about Geschlecht itself when he develops that notion in the title essay. That's another oddity about it. So it seems like there's just several <coughs> strange things happening in that, which I chose just for reasons of what I've been working on, to relate to what looks to me like, um, where should I put it, a, a slightly um, 
don't want to say hasty because that implies it's careless. I know it's exactly careless, but a, a rapid reading of Aristotle or a, 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 a use of Aristotle that has a very restrictive view of Aristotle that serves the purpose of playing gotcha with Heidegger and saying, caught you out being classical. And Aristotle, like everybody else, but Derrida's lights, shouldn't be reducible to the proprement Aristotelian. If Derrida's right in general, Aristotle is not properly Aristotelian, and by definition could not be. Yeah, Sam. Um, just maybe a comment on that. As you're speaking now, I can't help but think that possibly the just the pedagogical context of the seminar, <coughs> even though it's the first year at the Ecole de Hautes Études, like this kind of and so it's, it, it is a question given that you've sort of worked through so many of his seminars. There's kind of, I find often in the seminars there are these gestures to his sort of more robust positive work, like a theorization of dissemination somewhere else. But because it's in a seminar. He doesn't. He deliberately doesn't go there, and also the kind of the stereotypical, the Aristotelian Aristotle, because it's in a seminar. Sure. Um, sure. Just the shorthand. Think, just that's absolutely the right. That the shorthand yeah. it happens, and probably we couldn't think anything without it. So if every exactly. time we mentioned the proper name of a of an author, mm -hmm. um, we had to take all the precautions that would be necessary to separate out something of that author from the tradition that has been the dominant tradition in the reception, we would probably go crazy and never get any work done. So I'm actually quite sympathetic to that gesture. What seems um, strange to me is that I don't believe anywhere in Derrida does that more generously. The reading of La Mythologie Blanche I think is genuinely brilliant, but it's not the same kind of reading as the reading of Plato in Plato's Pharmacy. Okay. Um, and apart from that, I don't really see in Derrida the same kind of, you know, I love everything I deconstruct. It doesn't seem like he loves Aristotle at all. Um, and that's just of interest to me. It's not just, hey, you're being unfair to my boy Harry Aristotle. Um, it, it, there's more at stake in that gesture, it seems to me, partly just in the construction in general of what we call the history of metaphysics or metaphysics of presence. <coughs> And especially as for, he for Heidegger, Aristotle is so enormously important throughout the 20s and into the 30s. And his readings are so detailed and careful and patient and so on. So it's just an interesting, for me at any rate, interesting moment in the relationship between Derrida and Heidegger that Aristotle receives such very different treatment in terms of um, the amount of attention, the amount of importance granted. And so that's one thing. Yeah. The other thing about the gesture towards polysemia and dissemination is that um, it's not clear on the basis of what he actually says in G3 that he's really talking about dissemination directly in his sense of thought. It, it seems almost like a blurring of something where he's going to say Heidegger can't think dissemination in a rigorous way. Implication, I can. But when you go and look at that rigorous uh, thinking of dissemination, it doesn't seem immediately clear how to map that onto the criticism of Heidegger. Because with Heidegger, it just seems like he can think polysemia, and then if it gets out of hand, he kind of doesn't like it. But it's not. Dissemination is not polysemia got out of hand, at least not quite in that sense. So again, there's something a little bit strange to me, at any rate, in that, in that gesture. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, in, in regards to the questions that have been asked, whether you've thought much about the way Trockel asked that Ein be written in Ein Geschlecht, right? So he wanted it written with the letters separated from one another. Literally, they're not syntactical in the way in which we're supposed to place letters together. And so that seems to me a possibility for thinking kind of syntactical Excess. Yeah, that, I really didn't want to go there because I know Rodrigo's written about exactly that space. Exactly, okay. That, that All right, word nice. in, yeah. in detail, and I certainly didn't want to go treading into that, uh -huh. into that zone directly, but I, I do think that's right. And I also think, and this is a more troubling possibility because it seems very compelling as you read through Dehida's account, that the motifs in Heidegger that seem to valorize the one 
in, in its different senses. The one has many senses. It's, it's one thing, but it's also one thing among others, but it's also one thing in the sense of a unified thing. The whole history of political theology is in that ambiguity of the word one, which Aristotle does <coughs> pretty good work um, starting to unpack, and Aristotelianism then kind of undoes, rather than letting it um, proliferate. So, if it's possible to read the one in that way, it might be possible on the more generous reading of Heidegger to read Heidegger's appeals to the one in that more generous, spaced out way. And one place you could look is the quick reference he makes to the essay Die Sprache, where Heidegger um, talks a lot about difference, that mm -hmm. sheet with the hyphen, um, and there's quite explicit, both very <coughs> strong foregrounding of the value of difference. Um, <coughs> so when Derrida says the difference between dissemination and polysemia is difference, you might think of Heidegger saying <coughs> a difference. And that difference is related to a notion of the one that doesn't seem to me at any rate to be quite as reductive as Derrida. It seems to imply it is in the same passages that I was looking at. There's a, there's a quote where he explicitly refers to that moment in a quick way of saying another example of finding a reducing difference has to be reduced to the one. It's not exactly a reduction that's going on in that moment in Dishpraf, it seems to me. I mean, it's mysterious to know what is going on. And I wouldn't want to suggest that Heidegger comes up out of all this unscathed or smelling of roses, so there would be no complications or um, objections to be made. But it, it seems like there's more room for maneuver. Another quick way of saying that would be around the gathering motif would be to say, as I think Peggy said earlier, I think it was Peggy, um, that if difference or dissemination were absolute, uh, maybe it was after Francesco's paper, uh, that there would be nothing. There would be, you, can't, you can't think, um, you can't think, in my terms, scatter. <coughs> A scatter is always relatively gathered. You can't think an absolute scatter. An absolute scatter vanishes as scatter if it's absolutized. So one of the nice things about the motif of scatter is that it's always relatively pulled together. So there is a, there is a there is an element of gathering in the very thought of scatter itself, and it's not the dialectical motif and so on and so forth. But it doesn't seem to me to just because a scatter in order to a scatter has to be relatively gathered, I don't think that commits me to a metaphysical understanding of the one and saying, oh, well, let's gather it then and get rid of it as scatter. There's a way of respecting the scatter of scatter, I think, that doesn't involve absolutizing it, which is, of course, a metaphysical constraint anyway, and it doesn't involve absolutely reducing it to the one. I think we have time for one more question from Dan. You're good. Um, in that case, let's thank Jeff again. Okay.